pianist stopped, so that means it's time to go, right? All right. Uh, my name is Kerry Bosey. I'm uh, a pastor at, uh, in retirement. And no, I'm not coming out of retirement to do this. I'm still retired. <laughs> but this is a privilege to come and be here. But I have to tell you, honestly, I'm getting a little more nervous all the time uh, here. And here's, I think, why. Um, when I was first here, um, I, it was new. And so uh, the faux pas that, uh, that happened in my leadership, you know, you could all go, well, he doesn't know what's going on here. Well, I've been here long enough. I'm, you know that I know what's going on here. And so now you know, you will know that it's my incompetence that you're experiencing, not... So I'm a little more nervous about, you know, that being laid out there. Uh, welcome uh, to worship here. Welcome to those who are uh, online. Uh, the flowers uh, by the altar are given by Shannon Noel in memory of Alan Storkson's birthday on April 23rd. So nice to have those adorning our space. How about we stand for the confession and forgiveness? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. You know it takes nerve to do that. Honesty isn't, honesty isn't always easy. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake God forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our Christ, good shepherd of the sheep, you seek the lost and guide us into your fold. Feed us. Feed us and we shall be satisfied. Heal us and we shall be whole. Make us one with you, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. morning. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 4 verses 5 through 12. A reading from Acts. The next day the rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Cephas, John, and Alexander, and all who were the, of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what, by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and the elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth 
whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there was no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. The word of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our second reading is from John, the first chapter. We know love by this, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need, and yet refuses to help. Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth, and we will, and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, We have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite any children to come forward. So today we're talking about some sheep. What kind of noise do sheep make? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. So I thought today we're just going to read it straight out of the Spark Story Bible because sometimes it just, the best way to hear it is through a story Bible. So David the shepherd loved his sheep. He led them to beautiful fields where they ran and they played and they jumped and they kicked up their heels. They ate the lush green grass and feasted on delicious berries. They drank from cool mountain streams and splashed in refreshing waterfalls. David cared for each and every lamb. Now if one wandered over the hill, David was quick to go and find it. He'd put the lost lamb on his shoulders and sang sweet songs and hum soft melodies. Sometimes he played his harp to help the tired lambs fall asleep. Does your mom or dad sometimes play soft music so you fall asleep? No. No. (laughs) During times of danger, David fought against wild animals with only a slingshot and some stones. His sheep were not afraid because David was always with them. Do you see the sheep? Yeah. David thought 
thought about what he did as a shepherd and thought that God cares for people in many of the same ways that he cared for his sheep. One day, David wrote a song to tell everyone God is like a shepherd. God loves and cares for each and every one of us. God is my shepherd. He gives me all I need. He gives me wonderful places to rest and sleep. He lets me splash and play in cool, clear waters. Do you like to splash? Yeah. yeah. Do you like to splash? Yeah. He helps me do what is right. I'm not afraid even in the darkest nights because you are with me, God, and your protection comforts me. When danger comes, you give me strength. My life is filled with your love, and all I want is to be with you my whole life long. David sang his song to his sheep, thankful for all the ways God loved and cared for him. How do you know that God loves you? I don't know. No. Do, you don't know. How, why does God, does Jesus love you? Yeah. Yeah, why does Jesus love you? Because you're one of his children, and you're one of his children, and your mom is one of his children, and all those people out there are some of his children. And God is the shepherd, and we're like his little sheep that God takes care of. And when we're afraid, he comes and he protect, He kind of helps us, right? So we don't feel afraid. So can you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we thank you for being our shepherd. Help us to be like sheep and to come to you knowing that we are your sheep. The kind of sheep who you call by name and who you protect and always come and rescue. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for Hallelujah verse, like we're right in the middle of Easter. The Holy Gospel according to where are we at? John, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I don't know if you've noticed, this is, the, uh, this is a Sunday that is commonly referred to in the church as Good Shepherd Sunday. We're hearing a little bit about the Good Shepherd. Some more. I am the Good Shepherd, Jesus said. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep the sheep. Uh, that little aside, Tara, that you did was uh, when you said, they look kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, we, we do. <laughs> <clears throat> the hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, Sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I suppose the hired hand is only in it for the money. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay my life down for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I will bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I laid down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to do this, to lay it down, and I have power to... Take it up again. And this I have received from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. This week, um, my wife Deb and I went to a movie entitled uh, The Civil War. Civil War. Uh, the latest rendition of it, right here in Jamestown. Um, did anybody else, has anybody else seen that yet? Civil War? 
Nobody else has yet? Wow. It is a, uh, as my wife described it, um, it leaves one finding that they've gone quite a while without breathing. (laughs) This violent, terrifying movie brings to life out of our collective imaginations a worst-case scenario outcome of the deep divisiveness that is present in our country. There is in this divisiveness that you are so aware of, that we're all so aware of, um, a strong anti-immigrant, anti-minority sentiment. And it's clear that this misguided hunger for being of the right identification uh, in order to be a true American is one of the things that's going on in this movie It was upon reflecting on this movie that we just saw this last Wednesday as one of the Unison Bank freebies. (laughs) How many Unison Bank folks out there? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. As I reflected on that movie, that's kind of what inspired me to decide to do something that is very old school uh, in the church, yet something not done much anymore uh, for reasons that you'll easily figure out. That old practice is what led to a large portion of the New Testament existing. Leaders of the church would write letters of guidance or reflection or encouragement and yes, even admonishment to congregations for those letters to be read by a local leader, a local member of the church. I'm going to read for you a letter that, uh, unless you received the Lutheran magazine, which is no longer in print, uh, you would not have read yourself. Uh, How many in its later days received the Lutheran magazine in their their homes? not Not a lot of people did. It's a letter from our ELCA Bishop Elizabeth Eaton addressing an important contemporary American issue, um, Christian nationalism. But first, as a reminder of a need for a message like that of Bishop Eaton's, I want to quote for you an article that is, that is not atypical of the kinds of sentiment that seems to be unfortunately growing in our country. This is from an article that appeared recently in the online news organization uh, publication, if you want to call it, called Politico. I quote, William Wolfe, a man dedicated to the supportive, dedicated to and supportive of the Christian nationalist uh, movement, told a crowd of Christians at a conference that they are, quote, close to a time when it will be necessary to take up arms in defense of their faith. He went on to say, if we have ever lived in a point of time in American history since the Civil War that we could argue that now is the time to take up arms again, I think we are getting close. And he goes on, even though as Christians we seek peace, when the enemy when the enemy is pressed upon us if we fail to heed the call to arms then we are acting as cowards when the enemy is pressed upon us in the eye of national christian nationalism the enemy is any organization or any individual, including a president and anybody else, that promotes racial, gender, and religious inclusion as a hallmark of American society. Those are the enemies. Christian nationalism is based on the belief that America was founded as a Christian nation and that a far-right fundamentalist interpretation of the Bible should guide all policy agendas. That's what Christian nationalism 
is. This is a, uh, we're in a democratic society. This vision is a theocratic society. Theocratic, it's from a couple of Greek words. Uh, the Greek word for God is theos. And the Greek word for kratic or krasi, it comes from kratia, means power, rule. So God's power, rule, is the aim of Christian nationalism. It is a worldview that, when it comes right down to it, leaves very little room for equal governance in a diverse, pluralistic society that, um, that America is. And so Bishop Eaton's letter to the church is one of, in one of the last publications of the, the print publications of the Lutheran magazine. Greetings, dear church. My husband and I live in Skokie, Illinois, a diverse community. It's a, like a northern suburb of Chicago. Our neighbors to the west are an octogenarian Taiwanese evangelical couple, couple who regularly order meals from kosher to go. Our neighbors to the east are Ukrainian and Russian multi-generational families. Our grocery stores have both kosher and halal food departments. As I drive past the elementary school on my way to work, I see moms and dads in jeans along with women in saris and hijabs and men in thobes or yarmulkes. More than 90 languages are spoken in the homes of our school district. Together, we pay our taxes, mow our tiny lawns, worship, raise our children, and pretty much get along in our little village of Skokie. Late one afternoon, a few years ago, I was finishing up yard work. I had been weeding and trimming all day. I was tired and grass-stained. Just one more pile of leaves needed to be swept up. And I noticed a woman walking toward me, so I hurried to get the sidewalk cleared. She stopped. She told me that she had seen me working all day and thought that I might be too tired to prepare supper. She had made a meal for me and my husband. It was during Ramadan, the, the month when Muslims fast from food and water during the day and, and engage in prayer and acts of charity. This was her act of charity and generosity. She smiled and walked away. I was stunned. There has been an alarming rise in hate speech and violence against religious and ethnic minorities in this country. At the same time, we've seen an increased polarization among us in our country, even in our dear church. There is a movement to define what it means to be a real American. Some would define this some would define this as white, Christian, and native-born. When Lutheran immigrants first came to this country in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, they weren't considered real Americans. They didn't speak English or fit into the deist Calvinist religious majority. They were other and therefore suspect. German Lutheran immigrants weren't considered white when they settled here. Neither were Irish, Italians, or Poles. Catholics and Jews were considered an alien threat. Long ago, the Puritans fled religious persecution in Europe. The First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free expression thereof. Yet an element in our country wants to legislate that the United States is a Christian nation where Christianity should be privileged. 
Only Christians should hold office. This is Christian nationalism, which is neither Christian nor patriotic. There's no doubt that the founders of our country were largely Christian and that a majority of Americans identify as Christian. But that is different from declaring Christianity as the established religion of the United States. And dear church, let's be clear, let's not be deceived. A Christian nationalist would not define Lutherans as Christian. God knows I love my country. This beautiful, fragile, yet surprisingly resilient experiment in democracy and nationhood that's not predicated on shared ethnicity is unique among nations. My grandfather, father, and uncles all served during either or both World War I and World War II. I had the honor of placing a wreath on behalf of the ELCA at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington National Cemetery. I won't have my patriotism questioned. Christian nationalism is a perversion of the gospel and a threat to our democracy. It's precisely because I love my country that I warn against it. Who is a real American? I say that my Muslim neighbor walking freely down the street in a hijab to offer a meal to her Christian neighbor during Ramadan is a real American. Motivated by her Muslim faith, she acted as a neighbor to me. She's not less American because she's Muslim. Because she is an American, she can be her authentic self and participate in building our community and country. Bishop Eaton concludes with these words. What binds us together is not ethnicity, but shared participation in our civic life, springing out of our various cultural heritages and working for the common good. On this Good Shepherd Sunday, this sermon, well, might not seem like it focused on Jesus, the Good Shepherd. And yet in my view, and I hope in yours, this message of Bishop Eaton's surely does a better job of reflecting the spirit of a Good Shepherd who died for all than some other messages that are vying for our hearts and our allegiances.
believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let's pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Shepherd and God, gather your church whenever we wander from you and one another. Empower our church in ministries around the world to worship and serve alongside global companions as equal partners and co-workers in the gospel. God of grace, nurturing God, preserve the health of our ecosystems, inspire scientists, researchers, conservation organizations, and, and all people entrusted with the task of caring for creation, that we may be better stewards of the world around us for the sake of those who will come after us. God of grace, hear our prayer. Almighty God, lead nations and communities to share resources, to cooperate in solving conflicts, to listen to the wisdom of indigenous peoples. Help all those with power to share it and to use that power for good. God of grace, hear our prayer. Loving God, protect the very young and the very old, those living without housing, victims of domestic abuse, and all who live with chronic illness or compromised immune systems. Guide communities to actively care for people who are vulnerable. God of grace, hear our prayer. Gracious God, help this and all communities of faith to listen for your voice, your voice. Call us away from things that distract us from following you. Invite us to more deeply love and serve people who are lonely, isolated, feeling left out. God of grace, hear our prayer. Living God, we give thanks for our ancestors in faith. Strengthen us to share the good news in our own day. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our risen and living Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's share a sign of that peace with one another.
Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth, nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way that all may know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Good Shepherd, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so, with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, along with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join in singing their unending hymn. He's betrayed our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and gave it for his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you and for all for forgiveness. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let's with boldness pray in the words that our Lord gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Those who sin against us, save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for all is ready. You may be seated. Just a reminder that there is uh, grape juice as an uh, option, as well as gluten-free uh, bread. So if you desire one of those, just let uh, your server know with a, just a sign of a, perhaps a finger.
The body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just a couple of uh, announcements about things that are coming up. Uh, new member class dates have been changed to the first two, uh, well, the 8th and the, the 8th and the 22nd of May. Um, contact the uh, church office if you or somebody you know is interested in attending. Uh, Lady Spring Brunch is next Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, it's going to be fun. Invite your mom, daughter, sister, friend. Um, more information and sign-up sheet is on the nursery window. Uh, Atonement High School seniors graduating this year can pick out one of the lovely quilts that the church later, ladies made and have on display on the pews. Uh, quilts will be blessed and presented to the seniors at May 5th, the May 5th service. I think, what is this, the 21st? So you got the 21st, 28th, the 5th. You leave these out for like two weeks. That's really cool. I, I was telling Darlene earlier, churches I've served before that uh, put their quilts out, it's like a for a Sunday and they're gone, you know. So good for you doing that. And um, Josh and Lloyd did a fantastic job leading the ALC Brotherhood for the pancake and sausage feed. 174 people ate their fill. Yes, yeah, let them, let them know. Let them know. Shall we stand for the benediction? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. The closing song. and serve the Lord.
Thanks be to God. All right, good.